What's going on, Freedom House? How are we doing today? Yeah. Awesome. So glad to be with you today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Weston Keith, and I'm the uh, Vertical Youth Director here at Freedom House. It's my great privilege and honor to serve the young people of this church on a week-in and week-out basis, and I think that we have the best teenagers in the world. Yeah. Certainly so. Uh, but yeah, I'm just so glad to be with you here today. And uh, first of all, I want to honor my senior pastors, Troy and Penny Maxwell. Uh, if it wasn't for their leadership, I wouldn't be on this platform with you today. And uh, I'm just so grateful that we have pastors that live out the mission statement on that wall. They really do truly equip people to experience Christ's freedom every day. And they've equipped me to be able to come and share with you today. So I'm just grateful for them and for their leadership of this church. Church, would you just join me in just honoring our senior pastors? They are phenomenal leaders. Now, you might be wondering, okay, what is this young kid in the glasses up here doing? You know, where is Pastor Troy? Well, Pastor Troy and Penny um, are away with their family. They're getting some much-deserved and well-needed uh, rest. Uh, they're on a slight vacation. And who agrees that our senior pastors need some time to get away? Uh, it is a full-time job spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically to lead this church well. And uh, our pastors do it so well that they deserve a little bit of time off. So uh, I will be um, stepping in for PT today. I'll try to live up and uh, fill his shoes. Um, I could never fill his t-shirt bicep size, but I maybe can fill his shoes today. Maybe. All right. Well, I've got to do two shameless plugs. I have to do it. We do have a youth ministry, and I'm gonna, I have to tell you about it right now because over the past couple of weeks, I've been talking to parents who come up and they say, I had no idea there's youth ministry. I've been here for 10 years, and I had no idea. Uh, what? You know, so I have to tell you today, we do. Vertical meets here every Sunday night from 6.30 to 8.30, and we have a blast. We encounter God, we grow in relationship with Jesus, and we go and uh, grow in community with each other. And so I want to encourage you, if you've got a young uh, teenager from 7th to 12th grade, you need to get them plugged in ASAP. Make sure that they're in the house of God. And secondly, we do have epic summer camp coming up. Now, now I know that parents are a little bit hesitant. I don't know, you know should I send my kid to this camp? Well, let me, let me put it this way. Parents have no qualms, it seems, to send their kid off to a basketball camp or a baseball camp or whatever that will give them a, a you know, kind of a, you know, some kind of result in a sport or whatever. But how much more uh, is it important for them to get something spiritually invested into them? So this summer, while they're going to basketball camps and all that stuff, make sure that you invest not only in their sporting abilities, but also into their spiritual lives because that'll change their life. So I'm done. All the advertisements are over. Thank you. Thank you for that. This ad was paid for by your, your local youth pastor. Um, so either way, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be with you guys today. Let's pray really quickly and just invite God's Holy Spirit to be in this place. Would you join me as I pray? God, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you in the, that in this moment, you're beginning to just fill up this room with your presence, God. You're going to speak to our hearts today, God. And I just pray that you would give us uh, ears to listen, God, eyes to see, and a heart to receive. Father, help us to see things for, through spiritual eyes, God and see what truth you have to reveal to us today. It's the name of Jesus Christ that we pray, and everyone said, amen. amen. All right, so we are in a series called Game Changers. Now, uh, Pastor Troy last week talked a little bit about some awesome comeback stories in the sport of golf. Um, and you know, I love the idea of Game Changers because it all kind of revolves around this idea that in a sporting event, one decision, one action, one choice can change the course of a game. Does anybody know that's true? That in one instant, everything could be looking one way, one team could be in the lead and just totally winning, and then in an instant, one thing happens and the whole game changes forever. Well, when we as a church creative team were coming up with the idea for this series, we realized that that was true not only in sports, but it's also true for your spiritual life for your life right now, that you are one decision away, you are one action away, you are one encounter with God away from seeing your life changed. All the circumstances that you're dealing with right now can change in an instant with the power of God. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about that. I know Pastor Troy shared with you guys about golf and uh, I've played golf once, <laughs> once. And uh, is there any golfers in the house? Yeah, you, I, I commend you. I don't know how you do it. But I love football, basketball, all that kind of stuff. But my absolute favorite sport of all time is boxing. Do I have a boxing fan in the house tonight? Right back there. I love boxing. I grew up watching it. I mean, I loved 
uh, just everything about it. I, I loved watching boxers prepare for their fights. They were uh, just so, uh, they had so much tenacity. They had so much endurance, so much strength. And it's something about two guys getting into the ring and going at it hard and trying to achieve victory with a head-to-head battle, something about that inspires me. And I just get all pumped up and I'm like, yes. And I love boxing. So as I was thinking about that, I wanted to pull out a great sporting moment for you. Uh, something that we could watch together and um, kind of a game-changing moment in a certain boxing match. And the one that we're going to take a look at today involves a fighter by the name of Diego Corrales. Now, Diego is fighting for the lightweight championship. He's uh, in the 10th round of this boxing match. Normally, they last 13 rounds, and so he's towards the end of this fight. Diego is worn out. He is exhausted. His face is swollen from being punched. He's, he's on his last leg here in the 10th round. That almost never happens. That towards the end of a championship boxing match, you get knocked onto the canvas twice, and somehow you find the strength to get up and keep fighting and not only just survive, but to take a victory. That's pretty rare. You know, later on, uh, after that fight, one of the reporters was talking with Diego, and they said, man, how did you do it? He says, I was willing to fight through hell to get a victory. Let me ask, are you willing to fight through hell today to get a victory? Because the reality is, is that we are in the ring every day with an adversary who keeps knocking us down. We've been getting knocked over and knocked down so many times in life. But here's the thing about today, guys. We're talking about a game-changing moment that even though Satan has been knocking you out so many times, I believe that today, when we begin to press into the power of God, he's going to give you everything that you need, not only just to stand back up and survive, but to overcome and have a victory in your life. Can I get an amen today? Well, you know, I don't only uh, enjoy watch, watching uh, boxing. I actually used to like to participate in it. Um, I used to actually try to box. Keyword, try. Um, me and my buddies, we would watch boxing and we'd get so pumped up. Uh, I used to watch this reality show about boxing called The Contender. Did anybody ever watch that show? Like, I think maybe, like, yeah, a couple people like uh, Sylvester Stallone put it on. It was the American Idol of boxing. So instead of, uh, my friend J-Mac back there told me to say this. This is his joke. He said, instead of um, singing to, uh, what, what did you say? Um, instead of uh, singing to win, you're swinging to win. <laughs> yeah, corniest pun I think I've ever heard in my life. But I, I love J-Mac's jokes. Um, Either way, it was this uh, really funny reality show, and they'd box, and I, I loved it, absolutely loved it. And so we would watch this, me and my buddies, we'd watch these boxing matches, and we'd get so pumped up, and I want to do that too. And so we'd go, I remember I went to Walmart, and I bought a mouthpiece, I got the big boxing gloves, everything, and uh, me and my buddies would get together, and we'd go to a basement or a friend's backyard or whatever we could find, and we'd start uh, boxing, which is really just like, <laughs> you know, just something like that. And we had a blast, I mean, it was a lot of fun. Luckily, nobody got hurt. That was probably the stupidest thing we'd ever done. Um, but we would do this, and I remember one particular moment um, where I was in a boxing match that didn't go so well for me. Um, now, my best friend in the world is right here in the front row, uh, Zach Hosey. He's uh, the co-youth leader with me. We do ministry together. I've known Zach since I was like three years old, and we've been best friends our whole lives and we're still doing ministry together, and man, he's just uh, such a great friend to me, but I think this was probably, this boxing match was the lowest point of our relationship, uh, because um, I, I step into the ring, or this dirt patch, really, in someone's backyard with Zach, and uh, I recognized a couple of things about him. If you know Zach, he's definitely got some height advantage on me. His arms are a couple inches longer than mine. Uh, he's an ex-police officer, and uh, he's always been kind of a rough, gruff, tough guy, and when we were in high school, the, the differences of, you know, those advantages were even more drastic. So uh, I'm sitting there, and I, I see Zach across from me, and I'm like, okay, all right, I've, I've planned this. I know my strategy, and my strategy that I had really figured out and put a lot of time in was run at him as fast as I can and start swinging. That was my strategy, and I thought it was a pretty good one. So uh, the bell rings, or our friends just say, go ahead and get it. So I, go, I take off running at Zach, and he just stands there, and he's ready, and he's in his stance, and I just ah, you know, come flying at him. And I think I might have landed one good punch, and in that moment, uh, I might have put one uh, punch on him by the time that he got into a good power stance and just went, 
pop and hit me right in the face. One good time, my eyes rolled into the back of my head. My head went back, my arms dropped. I was doing the weekend at Bernie's. Uh, it, was, it was bad. It was bad. And I, my friends jump in. It's over. It's over. That's all he can take. So it was done. The fight was over. And I remember I went and I sat down and I was like, you know, trying to eat a whole bottle of Advil because my head was hurting. And uh, my friends were like, oh, man, do you remember that time when he did this just a minute ago? I was like, I don't remember anything. I, don't, I can't remember anything. But when I think about that moment, guys, when I think about that time uh, and that fight, I can't help but associate that with our spiritual life. We're locked in the ring with an adversary who's very powerful. And oftentimes we're at an extreme disadvantage. You see, Satan has been knocking people out for thousands of years. It's his specialty. He's really good at it. And for whatever reason, every day we step into the ring with Satan and try to do that same strategy that I used. I'm just going to start flailing wildly and hope I can win. And we try to overcome the obstacles and the temptations and the challenges in our life by our power, our strength, our abilities, and we fail every time. And not only that, as we're failing, he's hitting us so much that he's making us forget the promises of God. He's got us so focused on getting punched that we forget that God told us that we're overcomers. He, he's got us all confused, and we've got to realize that this Christian life is a fight. You see, it's a battlefield, guys. We've got a real enemy. He's looking to knock you out. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's his job. That's Satan's job is to take you out. And he is prowling around like a roaring lion looking to devour you. So what are we going to do when he shows up? Because it will happen. We're fooling ourselves if we think that this Christian life or life in general is going to be easy. It's a battle. Look at somebody and say, it's a fight. It's a fight. We have to realize that we've got to be prepared. And see, the reality is, is like I told you earlier, Satan has some major advantages on us. We are human. He is a supernatural being. He's a demon. He's been around for thousands of years. He knows the weaknesses of man better than we know ourselves. He is skilled at taking people out. And we can't ever hope to overcome the challenges that come our way in our own strength, period. But, you got to love the but. Here's the difference. See, the world, people that don't know Jesus, that's where they find themselves. But we don't. The Bible tells us that it's by the blood of Jesus and the word of our testimony that we overcome the world. Satan was very scary. Satan was powerful. Satan did have dominion over your life. But we just sang a song that says, Hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. He is risen. He is alive. The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. Nothing could keep God down. And now he's in your life, and he is working out his will through you. But you got to let him. You've got to be ready to press into the power of God so that he can do amazing things in your life so that you can have victory. Amen? Amen. So let's take a look at a couple, uh, a couple examples here. I, I, want to, I want to share with you a, a story out of the Bible of a young man who knew that this was true, that rather than relying on the physical, relying on his abilities and his strengths to overcome the challenges that came his way, he pressed into God's presence. He had faith in God to help him overcome the challenges that faced him. So let's take a look. If you have a Bible, you can turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Um, we're going to get there in just a moment. Uh, this is a very familiar story for some of you. Maybe you've never heard this story, but it's the story of David and Goliath. Anybody know that story? Yeah, it's a, that's an old one. But um, I want to just give you a little bit of backstory really quickly. So thousands of years ago, the Israelites are just minding their own business, and the Philistine army decides to come and invade their land. So the Philistine army, which is oftentimes, uh, you can kind of look at them as a symbol for uh, Satan, for the enemy, coming against God's people. So the Philistine army uh, has this giant force arrayed against the Israelites. They come out against them, and the Israelites see a problem coming at them, and they say, okay, well, easy. We'll, we'll handle it. I know how, what's going on. I'm skilled in battle. We know what's going on, so let's just get our troopers out there, and we'll handle it in the natural. That's how we're going to handle this problem. We'll, we'll take care of it. We got this. So the two armies line up to face each other, and uh, this is where the twist comes. They thought that they had the strength, that they thought the, they had the abilities, they thought that they had the wisdom, they thought they had everything down pat to have a victory that day, but all of a sudden, the Philistine army produces a giant, 
from their ranks, a 10 foot tall man who had 100 pounds of armor, several men dedicated solely just to carrying around his weapons because they were so large. He was the equivalent of an ancient day tank for the Philistines. And this man comes forth out of their ranks. And he says, okay, look, this is how we're gonna play this. You're gonna send out one champion to fight me. And if he can kill me, then you will have victory over us and we will be your slaves. If I win, you will serve us. In that moment, all of a sudden, the Israelite strategy, their strengths, their plans went out the window. They were paralyzed with fear. The, the abilities that they had no longer were able to overcome the obstacle that was in front of them. And for 40 days, this goes on. Goliath comes out of the, the ranks of the Philistines and mocks the people of God, calling them worthless, that they will never win, mocking God, just putting them down over and over. You know what, guys? I, I can't help but think that many of us today have an obstacle that's coming out in front of us every morning as soon as we wake up and is taunting us, telling you that you will never succeed, telling you that you are worthless, telling you that your past is too great, telling you that your marriage is destined to fail, telling you that you will never overcome the obstacle in front of you, and we're just being tormented by this obstacle. Now, we have a couple options here. Either one, we can choose to stay in submission to that problem, stay paralyzed in fear, or we can have a game-changing moment. Yeah. Who's ready to have a game-changer today? Yeah. You see, this is what happens. The Israelites are paralyzed with fear. They don't know what to do. Their power isn't enough to overcome this obstacle. But a young man by the name of David approaches the battlefield. He had just left the uh, fields where he was tending his father's sheep, and so David comes out to the battlefield bringing food to his brothers, and he sees the situation differently. You see, while everyone in the camp of uh, the Israelite army was looking at this circumstance through the eyes of the natural, seeing that we don't have the ability, we don't have the strength, it's always going to be this way, I'll never overcome, that's how they were viewing things. David showed up on the scene, and he saw things through spiritual eyes. And that's where the difference lies, is when challenges come, how are we going to view them? See, this is what happens. David comes out in front of Goliath, and he says in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 42, he said, you come against me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. All of a sudden, David's opinion is way different. His view on things is way different than the rest of the army. See, the rest of the army probably thought, we need somebody that's bigger and tougher than Goliath. We need a bigger sword. But David didn't come up and say, I come against you with a bigger sword than you. He said, I come against you in the name of God. Yeah. He saw things differently. He realized how he could really overcome the obstacle in his life. Let's look at two things that David did right. First of all, he recognized what was coming against him. That's the first thing he says, is you come against me with sword, spear, and javelin. He recognized that it was an attack from the enemy, not a punishment from God. He realized that these things coming against him were just an obstacle thrown at him by Satan. And when he saw it from that perspective, he was able to see it through the lens of hope. He knew, hey, I, I recognize what you're doing right now. I recognize that this is a trial, a circumstance that might normally beat me out or anybody else out, but because I'm choosing to see it differently, I see the hope that I have in God. And I will have victory over this. That was David's first win. Secondly, while everyone else was paralyzed by their attacker, David moved. He chose to act on what was going on and to trust God. See, everyone else was paralyzed with fear. Every single one of the soldiers in the Israelite army could have come forth and said the exact same thing, claimed the exact same problem, but they promised, but they were too afraid to do it. They were paralyzed by fear. But David acted on it. You see, if we're not careful, the obstacles in our life will paralyze us from achieving our destiny. It'll keep us from being in the free life that we were meant to have because we're paralyzed by fear of the obstacle, of the reality that it will always be this way. It'll always, it's never going to change, and we're stuck in fear. And actually, what begins to happen is not only are we stuck in fear, we actually might react. We actually might start attacking, but we attack the wrong person. You see, the, the thing is, is in combat, in war scenarios, one of the best things that uh, can happen if you're uh, a fighting an opponent is to get them confused at who the real enemy is. If you can get friendly fire going on, they're doing your job for you. 
So Satan loves to get some friendly fire going on. He loves to get you to think that God is the one that's bringing the trials and the struggles into your life. He's the one that's just pushing all the problems. It's God's fault. He said he would provide, but he's not. He loves to get us confused. But see, this is the truth, guys. Check this out. Opposition in your life doesn't prove God's absence. It proves his presence. You see, God loves it when trials come into your life. You see, in uh, the book of James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Consider it all joy when you encounter trials of various kinds because it produces faith in your life. God loves it when there's an opportunity for your faith to grow because when your faith grows, that's how you please God. It, the Bible tells us that it's impossible to please God without faith. So when an obstacle comes, we have to stop looking at it from a standpoint of this is blocking me from getting to my destiny and looking at it as an opportunity to grow, to get stronger because what happens is the trial comes and if we operate through faith, and we push through in faith. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. We have overcome a trial and God gets glory. God loves it when you overcome trials. He is giving you everything that you need to overcome the trials. He loves it. He loves operating powerfully in your life. But what's the key? Faith. We've got to have faith in God. You see, this other point is true that God is able to turn around the things that were meant to destroy you for your good. He can turn it around. In the book of Romans 8, verse 28, it says that our God will work all things together for our good, for those who are called according to his purpose. You today are called according to the purpose of God. If you didn't believe it before, I'm telling you now, you are called according to the purpose of God. You have a plan. God has a purpose for you. God has a destiny for you. You are called according to the purpose of God, and he will work all things together for your good. Look at a neighbor and say, you are called. You're called. You see, this is so true, guys, because David, after he takes this little sling and throws a rock and hits Goliath in the forehead, Goliath falls. And what does David do? David walks over to Goliath, picks up Goliath's sword, and cuts Goliath's head off with his own sword. I believe that this is true. The things that have been pointed at you, the struggles that you've been dealing with for so long, the temptations, the bondage that's been in your life that's been attacking you for so long, God's gonna give you a victory in that, and it's gonna be the thing that sustains you in the future. You're going to come up against another giant in the future, and you're gonna be able to reach back and say, give me that sword I used last time. I'm ready to take this next giant down just the same. God's going to sustain you with the things that have come against you. You see, this is a very true statement. That the very thing that was meant to destroy David was used to deliver him. Yeah. I believe that God's going to deliver some people today. I believe that today there's going to be freedom from addictions and bondages. Freedom in strained marriages. I believe that the very thing that, God, you, that God's going to use, the very thing that was meant to destroy you for your good. And you're going to be able to help other people that are going through the same thing. I believe that's true today. Now, this is all really great. I know that uh, oftentimes we can come into church and hear all the promises of God. And we get hyped up about it. We're ready. I'm ready to take the sword out of the enemy's hand. Yeah. But what are the practical steps to get there? We've got to know. See, I understand this about the Christian life. Is that everything that God does for us is like a two-way street. God offers freely salvation, but we have to accept it. God is freely pouring out his spirit, but we have to choose to live in it. We have to have a two-way street going with God. Now, he's not just going to pour out all the blessing and do everything for you. We have to begin to train a little bit. You see, David wasn't just some boy off the street. He had been out in the wilderness training. He didn't just walk through the battle by mistake and... Oh, Whoa, where am I? Oh, dude, it's a giant, man. You know, throw a rock at this guy. No, he had prepared. Everybody say, it's training day. Training. You see, the, the thing in a, a boxing match um, is you never see a fighter uh, just randomly step into the ring one day. They're preparing for months and months and months for the fight. In fact, if we're not training guys in our spiritual life, we are going to fail. You see, I, I think about a boxing, another boxing term is um, a term called, they just got off the couch. Anybody heard that term before? 
Uh, you know, sometimes a boxer will be out of the game for a little while. He, uh, he hasn't fought in some time. Maybe he hasn't been in the gym and maybe he's just now starting to get back on track and, you know, he's kind of weak. He hasn't really been in, in the gym very much. Other boxers that are hungry, training, ready to fight, they go after those guys because they're an easy win because they're just coming off the couch. Satan is looking for people just coming off the couch in their spiritual life. He's ready to take those people out because he knows that someone that is training in the way of God is dangerous and he will flee from those people. He runs away from people that have been training in the things of God. See, David, he didn't just start fighting giants all of a sudden. He started with a lion. He started with a bear. Then he fought a giant. I believe that there's some little things in our lives today that we've just been missing out on. We've been trying to swing for the fences when we just need to start at the basics. Some very basic principles in our life that'll begin to give us victory in the big battles. Can someone say amen? amen. So we have to be prepared. We have to start training for our battles. We've got to get ready for when Goliath comes our way, are we going to have victory? You see, Paul, the author of two-thirds of the New Testament, knew that this principle was true. He knew it was true. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26 through 27, this is what Paul says. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. The guy that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament knew that, man, if I'm not daily working out my faith, if I'm not training in the way of God, I might be disqualified. I might get taken out. I've got to be on my guard. I've got to be on the cutting edge of my training. Somebody say it's training day. Training. We're going to look at four areas that a boxer will use to prepare for a fight. We're going to apply these principles into our life so that whenever we step into the ring, we're ready to start swinging. Come on, somebody. First thing that we're going to look at today in our preparation is diet. Everybody say diet. diet. Man, don't we love to skip this part. Man, it, whenever, uh, you know, the, the classic thing for me, I'm getting pumped about, I'm going to get in shape, man. Yeah, I'm going to do, yes, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to start lifting weights. But then after I'll go home and eat a pizza. You know, <laughs> everything that you do in the gym is for nothing unless you're eating the right kind of diet. Right? My man right there with the giant arms knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> strength. You've got to have the right kind of diet if you want to build strength. Amen? We know that. A, a fighter knows, it's absolutely true, that the things that he's putting into his body are what is, that's going to be the fuel to sustain him in the fight. His energy, his focus, his stamina, his strength comes from a foundation of a good diet. That's the first building block. We like to skip that part. We like to go to the heavy bag. We like to go to the speed bag. We like to say, I want to see God do some miracles in my life. I want to see God set me free from this. But we don't start with the basics. We want to go for the glamorous stuff. But I'm here to tell somebody, you got to start with the spiritual diet. you got to start on your spiritual diet. Let's look at the first thing. The first part of your spiritual diet is the word of God. The word of God. You see, the greatest fighter who ever lived was Jesus Christ. He stepped into the ring with death and won. The most fearsome opponent of all, Jesus stepped out of the ring and death shriveled up and died. But how did he do it? How did, how did Jesus accomplish that? Well, whenever Jesus was training out in the wilderness before he started his ministry, Jesus was out spending time in the presence of God, and Satan showed up to try to knock him off course of his destiny. And Satan starts tempting Jesus in every way he possibly can. But Jesus didn't start shooting lightning bolts out of his fingers and like flying around and like heat breath and all that kind of stuff. No, no, no. He just started saying the word of God. He just started speaking scripture. <laughs> and how powerful is it to know that when we just begin to speak scripture, Satan's mouth is shut in our life. Temptations are stopped when we proclaim the truth of God. But see, the difference is, is we've got to be eating the word of God. It needs to be in us so that when the pressure comes and we're squeezed, what's coming out? The word of God comes out when the pressure's on. So the first part of our diet is the word of God. Jesus said this. He said, men shall not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We've got to have a healthy diet of the word 
And I'm not speaking to you today from a standpoint of, oh, I got it. I'm, you know, I read every day for five hours and I do a lot of chandalas. And I, it's a struggle. It is hard to read the Bible. Have you ever wondered why it's so hard? Have you ever stopped to think of, why is it so difficult for me to spend five minutes reading a passage of scripture? Because your enemy is in direct opposition of you doing that. If he can cut off your nutrition, if he can get you starving spiritually, then he's got you. You're weak. But we're gonna stop that today. Second part of our diet is living water. Look at somebody and say living water. Living water. You see, when fighters are in the midst of their training, whenever they're even in the midst of a fight, they're constantly having an influx of water. They need that water to stay refreshed. They need that water to have uh, the, the sustainability to keep going through the fight. You see, if they, if they don't drink water, their, their muscles begin to cramp up. They fatigue. They, they wear out. They're not able to go the distance because they don't have water. The same thing is true about our spirit. If we're not being filled with living water, the Holy Spirit of God, every day, we start to fatigue. Have you ever wondered why life is so difficult? And man, you know, nothing's changing. And gosh, you know, I, I go through life and, you know, God has all these promises for me, but I don't ever really see them. And I just, I'm kind of weak and, you know, I'm not able to really stand up to temptation when it comes. And I don't understand. Well, it's just like me, man. Whenever I used to be uh, in college, I would go from, uh, uh, you know, paycheck to paycheck kind of thing. And when I'd go to the gas station, my, my car would be on E and I'd collect like all the pennies that I could. Can I have like $1.50 on pump number one? That's, yeah, that'll be half of a gallon. <laughs> okay. And I would, I'd barely put enough in there just to get by. And see, that's what happens when we, like I come to church like once a month. We're just, just barely enough to get by. But what happens in our life when God just fills us up with his presence? What can happen then? How far can we go? What can we accomplish when we're filled with living water? And I believe that this also applies. You might say, well, you know what, Weston, I, 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 I do spend time with God. I, I do, but, you know, everything else still isn't changing. Well, I believe that this principle is very, very true. You see, in um, the book of Psalms, or sorry, uh, the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, this verse is often associated with tithing. It says that if we honor God with the first fruits of our life, that he'll bless us and he'll actually pour out such a blessing that it will be to the overflow. I believe that when we are intentional to honor God with the first fruits of our day, the first fruits of our time, and we spend time in the presence of God, worshiping him, praising him, praying, listening to him, not only will he fill us up, he fills us up to overflowing. And all of a sudden, the things that haven't been changing in our life begin to be affected because God's presence is overflowing out of us onto different areas of our life. Can somebody say, overflow? You gotta be filled to overflowing with the presence of God. Second point is training. Some would say training. training. See, fighters will spend months, I'm talking months, anywhere from eight to 12 months, preparing for a fight in the gym. They will be lifting weights, running, jumping ropes, sparring, doing the whole nine yards, preparing for months on end for a fight that might last an hour. How much more so is it pivotal that we train every day for a fight that lasts our entire life? Yeah. We've got to be spiritually working out. You see, the Bible tells us to daily take up our cross, to work out our salvation on the daily, being in God's presence and working out our spiritual muscles so that we're prepared for the fights ahead. How do we do this? How do we practically do this? Well, just like a fighter is in a gym all the time, constantly working out, I believe that when we're in the house of God, that's where we begin to work out our spiritual muscles. You see, I believe that when we're serving, when we're in community, when we're in a place where we are preferring others before ourselves and serving somebody a coffee and taking care of a little kid, and doing whatever we can, we begin to be strengthened like never before. I, on a weekly basis, I'm standing in this room with the young people of this church and I'm pouring out, ministering to them, but I'm being blessed because of it. My character is being grown. My faith is rising because I'm serving someone else. God wants you to be plugged in the house of God. That's where you flourish. That's where joy comes. You see, this truth is uh, biblical. In Psalms 92, verses 13 through 15, it says, those who are planted in the house of God shall flourish. They'll flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. You know, I, I can't help but think that many of us, we come to church on a 
you know, bi-weekly basis, a once a month basis, maybe weekly, I don't know, but we, we haven't gotten involved in anything. We're not plugged in. We're not doing anything. And yet we leave and we just say, man, that church thing never works. I always leave kind of empty, man. You know, I'm just, you know, I never really feel changed. Well, you know what? The same principle applies to a gym. You can walk in the gym. You can kick the weights around a little bit. You can look at other people working out. You can see other people getting in shape. But until you start to do some work, until you start getting into the gym and lifting some weights, nothing will change about your life. Nothing will change about the outside of your body. The same is true. When you come to church and you just sit and you look around and you're not doing anything, you're not engaging in worship, you're not serving in the house of God, that is whenever you just sit there and nothing works. But when you start lifting some spiritual weights, baby, that's when life changes. You see, we got some aerobics groups in this church. They're called life groups. Are you in one? Are you in one? They help your heart get stronger. Come on, somebody. Serving in the house of God. That's how we train. That's how we train for combat. We're around other people that are doing the same thing and they spur us on. Here's a third point. Everybody say mouth guard. Mouth guard. Every fighter has a mouth guard, don't they? You never see a fighter get in the ring without a mouth guard because they might lose some teeth, won't they? They might bite their tongue out. Maybe if their jaw is flapping around loose, it might get broken. Well, you see, the enemy loves it when we don't have a mouth guard in because he can break our jaw. He can punch us and get us to start speaking from a broken mouth. We're stalking death, negativity. I'm, I'm wondering today, how are you talking to the circumstances that you're facing right now? What are you saying about them? Your, your, your relationship with your wife or husband struggling, how are you talking to them? What are you proclaiming over their life? You say your relationship with your children is a little bit strained. Are you talking to their failures or are you talking to their potential? How are you talking to the circumstances that you're facing today? The enemy would love to break your jaw, to get you talking death, to start speaking negatively. See, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 18.21 that the power of life and death is in the tongue. Here's a statement for you. Write this down because I believe this is from God. The loss or the victory and the challenge that you are facing today can be determined by what you are saying about it. I'm going to say that again. The loss or victory and the challenge that you are facing today can be determined by what you are saying about it. Put that mouth guard in, baby. Put that mouth guard in. Protect your mouth. Protect your language. Start proclaiming God's truth in circumstances. David, when he approached Goliath, could have said, you are pretty big and I'm probably going to die. He didn't say that. He said, I, I see you, but God's on my side. God's in my corner. I got this. So the same way, you know, I know what the bank statement says right now, but I'm going to keep tithing. I know what my friends are saying about my relationship with my wife. I know what we've said to each other, but I believe that God's a restorer. I know that my, my kid might be going crazy right now, but I know that God is a redeemer. I know that uh, I might be sick right now. I know what the doctor said about my body, but I know the healer. I know God Almighty, the great physician. What are you saying about the circumstance that you're in right now? Put a mouth guard in. And then here's our fourth and last point. Who's in your corner? Look at somebody and say, who's in your corner? You see, we all need a good coach in our life. Whenever you see a boxer step into the ring, you never see him in his corner alone, do you? There's always somebody in his corner. He's got a couple people. He's got somebody rubbing his shoulders. Oh, you got this champ. Come on. You got somebody holding the water in the bucket. You got somebody holding the title belt. Look what he did in the past, bragging on him a little bit. We all need somebody in our corner, don't we? We need somebody that's going to encourage us. <clears throat> Is anybody a fan of Rocky movies? I love Rocky movies. I love them. I used to watch them all the time. I've probably seen Rocky movies more than any other movie. I just watched them so many times as a kid. The I Have the Tiger montage, that would get me so pumped. I would be like, yes! And I'd get so stoked to see Rocky training and get into the fight and, Adrian, I did it! You know, all that stuff. And I, I loved it. It was great. And even though Rocky was a powerful fighter, he went the distance and he beat the I must break you Russian guy. And he... He beat Mr. T, for goodness sakes. I mean, he had it going on. Even though he had all those great victories, you know what's very true? Rocky would never have even stepped into the ring if it wasn't for his trainer, Mick. You see, whenever the opportunity came for Rocky to have his fight with Apollo Creed, the first opportunity, 
for Rocky to break through for success. He, he came to Mick and he said, hey, yo, Mick, I'm just a bum. I can't do it. But his trainer, Mick, his trainer, Mick, if you remember, you remember, do you guys remember Mick? That old man, he had that crooked hat and that old dirty sweater, a hearing aid with a cable hanging down. And he said, what are you doing, Rock? You gotta get in there. You can do it, Rock. And he did it. <laughs> so, so who's in your corner? Do you have a Mick right now that's speaking to your potential? That's helping you to see the things that you are called to do? Gosh, so many people miss out on amazing opportunities because they say, oh, I see Pastor Troy and he's doing all that great stuff, but you know, he's a pastor, that's, that's meant for him. I'm just, you know, whatever, that's not me. No, it's for you. God's got a plan for your life. You are called to do amazing things. You know, but sometimes we just need someone in our corner that helps us to see where we're weak to help correct our form. You see, that's what trainers do. They sit on the outside of the battle and tell you where you're getting punched so that you can keep your guard up, so you can protect yourself. They say, keep your gloves up, you're getting punched. Without somebody in our life to show us where we're weak, the enemy will knock us out. But they're there to help us see the weak spots. You know, they're also there to speak to our potential and to help us maybe change a little bit about who we are. You see, we normally say, ah, you know, that's just not me. Uh, my, my marriage is just, it's always going to be this way. Uh, it's never going to change. This is just how it is. You know, Rocky said that same thing. In the second movie, he's going to fight Apollo Creed again. First time, he didn't win. He just survived. He had just survived the fight. But this time, Mick wanted him to win. And Rocky was a left-handed, he was a southpaw fighter, and so he told him, Rock, we gotta change up your fighting stance. You gotta change something about you. You gotta do something you haven't done before. Something that feels a little bit unnatural. Do something outside of your comfort zone. So Mick literally tied Rocky's left arm, his power arm, the natural bend, who he thought he really was, to his side, didn't let him use it. Forced him to punch with that right hand. Hey, yo, Mick, how many times I gotta do this? <laughs> Until you get it. You know, that, catch that chicken. You know, that, that kind of stuff. Forced him to fight with the right hand. Then, this time, all of a sudden, Rocky steps into the ring with Apollo Creed. Now, Apollo expected Rocky to show up as a left handed fighter, but all of a sudden, now Rocky's ambidextrous. And he's doing something that he didn't even, he never thought he could do. And he got a victory that day. That's when he won, when he changed up his form. You know, I believe that today we need somebody in our life that's going to help us change up some things. You know what? This is just how I treat my wife. This is just how I treat my husband. This is just how I'm, this is just my life. This is how it's always going to be. Change the form. Have somebody that's willing to tie that weak arm down and make you fight a new way to get a victory in your life. It might be painful. It might be difficult. But we all need it. We all have to have that somebody in our life. You know what? I believe that some of you are here today and you don't have a Mick in your corner. You don't have someone speaking to your potential. You don't have someone reminding you of the promises of God. You don't have somebody that's be, being able to declare the truth that uh, God has promised you in the midst of a battle. You see, a, a fighter is in, locked in combat and is focused on the punches and all this stuff. But when the trainer's on the outside, they can see the whole thing. They can shout, hey, remember, remember this aspect of the fight. Remember this truth. Remember this promise. You know what I'm saying? There's somebody on the outside of your battle that can proclaim truth into your life. So when you're fighting the enemy, they will help to remind you of God's promises for you. Yeah. And maybe you don't have that. And today, I want to take a moment to do that. I want to take a moment to remind you of who you are, the promises that God has given to you. So I'm going to say a bunch of scriptures. Don't worry about trying to write it down. Just listen. Just receive God's word for your life. And this is you. This is the statement that you need to be saying. You see, my battle is not against flesh and blood, but with a spiritual enemy who seeks to destroy me. Ephesians 6, 12. I understand my enemy fights me because he fears me. And every time I resist him, he must flee. James 4, 7. Every time he reminds me of my past, I will remind him of his future. 
1 John 4, 4. It doesn't matter what the enemy sends my way because in Jesus Christ, I'm more than a conqueror. Romans 8, 37. No one can stand against the plans of God for my life. Isaiah 14, 27. With God's help, I will advance against every troop and I will scale every wall. Psalm 18, 21. No weapon formed against me shall stand. Isaiah 54, 17. I am steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and my labor is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. Romans 8, 11, my God always causes me to triumph. 2 Corinthians 2, 14, I will not give up. I will not grow weary of pursuing righteousness. Galatians 6, 9, I will press towards the mark to claim the prize that is already mine. Philippians 3, 14, and I am convinced that neither height nor depth, no power in hell, nothing in creation can separate me from the love of my God. And if my God is for me, who can be against me? Hallelujah! The Lamb is overcome! Let's begin to sing up truth. Hallelujah! We sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. Proclaim that truth over your life today. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. Just begin to thank Him today. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. God, we believe that today you have overcome the grave. You have defeated sin, hell, and death. And we are victorious in the name of Jesus. We believe it, God, and we claim the promises that you've made to us. Today, God, we're ready for our game changer. God, we're ready to see you move in our life. God, we are ready to change up our fighting stance. God, remind us of who we are. God, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you that you are moving right now. Thank you that you're in this place, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Guys, you see, the truth is, is that all those years ago, our Jesus hung on a cross so that every curse would be on him for us. He won the battle in the grave. And on the third day, the ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, and his perfect love overcame. He had you in mind when he was hanging on the cross. The basis of all of this training that we've begun begun to talk about today, the basis of that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Without him, we're nothing. We have to have a relationship with Jesus. I want to give you guys an opportunity right now to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you would, bow your heads right where you are. Every eye closed in this place, focusing on Jesus. His presence is here right now. The presence of Almighty God is in the room. When supernatural things enter into a natural room, things have to change. Addictions have to break. Circumstances begin to move. If that's you, you said, I mean, I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time. Now is your chance. On the count of three, I want you to put your hand up high as you can. This is your opportunity to fight Satan. This is your opportunity to swing the first punch. He doesn't want you to do this. He's trying to remind you right now. I believe somebody is thinking, no, I can't do it. No, I've done too much. Too much has been in my past. He's trying right now to keep you away from Jesus. Don't let him do it. On the count of three, put your hand up to the heavens and let me see you so I can pray for you. On the count of three, one, right now is your opportunity. Don't let it pass you by. Two, make the choice now. Start swinging. Three, put them up all over the room, all over the room, from the left to the right, hands all over the room. Let's give God praise as he is working right now in the lives of people in this room. Thank you, God. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep those hands up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. There's another group of people here today. You've already been in relationship with Jesus, but your eyes have been on the natural and not on the spiritual. And today, God reminded you of who you are and the promises that are over your life. If you want to change your fighting stance today, you want to see things through the eyes of God, would you put your hands up right now? Lift them up. We're going to pray for you. 
We're going to pray that God's going to fill you up with his Holy Spirit. He's going to teach you how to fight the adversary that has had victory over you for so long. You are going to claim the victory that is rightfully yours. The prize that is rightfully yours is coming right now. Church, repeat this prayer after me. In the name of Jesus, thank you, God, that right now I am being changed. Thank you for washing my heart clean. God, I've made a choice to follow you all the days of my life. Give me eyes to see your truth, God. Help me to love you and to serve you like never before. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said amen. Awesome. Let's give God a hand. Hallelujah, the Lamb has overcome. I believe that God called you here for a purpose today. When you walk out of this room, just keep on saying, it's training day. It's training day. I'm a conqueror, and I have victory in Jesus' name. Thank you guys so much for being here. We love you. You were dismissed. On your way out, slap three people a high five and say, it's training day.